Okay, and now our, our, we're very honored tonight to have a speaker, Mr. Scott Major. Scott is here. He is a renowned attorney, author, motivator, philanthropist. As an author, he's completed a number of publications, including or, uh, books, including You Are the Best, that combines great stories with great ways for you to understand how and why you think the way you do. And I think everyone has a copy of the book on their desk right now. Uh, Scott also leads Major Empowerment LLC, a worldwide motivational and legal education company focusing on empowerment. Maybe his uh, biggest contribution is he's been very generous with his time and his energy and his, and his money. He's raised, he's raised millions of dollars for charities. He's utilized his success as a jazz concert promoter to produce concert events for over a decade. And we're really proud to have him and we're going to spend a little time listening to Mr. Scott Major. Scott. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much, Mike. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. You know, uh, I was thinking about when I came here about a story that I thought was appropriate and I'm reminded of the man, the Jewish man, who tells his son the secret to life. He says, son, if you want to get ahead, math, that's the answer. If you do well in math, you'll be a superstar. He sends a Jewish kid off. The kid comes back with his first test, 72. He says, what's the problem, son? Math. If you don't get an A in your next math test, I'm going to send you to Catholic school. He sends a Jewish kid off. He comes back with his next test, 60. He says, that's it. I'm sending you to Catholic school. He sends him to Catholic school. About two weeks later, he comes back with his first test, 100. He says, what's the secret? He said, Dad, first day I walked into class, looked up, saw that guy kneel to the plus sign, said they're serious about math. <laughs> you never know what motivates people. And as professionals, you want to understand how to motivate people and how to bring loyalty and membership in and how to retain it. And the first way to understand that in terms of building your own happiness portfolio is to first understand what do you think? What do you think about? How do you think? What is your processing? And a lot of us make a lot of assumptions about what we believe other people mean and other people say. So I wanted to start out with this yellow sheet which you guys have which has questions on them. Questions which I'm sure some of you have looked at and all of you have got all the right answers. And we're going to go through these questions just to illustrate to you about how you think. The first question on here is, Joanne and Jackie were born on the same day of the same month of the same year. They have the same mother and father, but they're not twins. How is that possible? Well, the first inclination that people think about is, is it a stepfather? Is it a different person? Is it? The answer is, they're triplets. But your mind doesn't think that way. Your mind makes assumptions that there's a trick question. Let's look at number two. Imagine you're in a boat with a large hole in the bottom. Sharks are swimming around. You're on all sides and the boat is sinking fast. How do you survive? Now, I've gotten a hundred different answers to this. And the answer is, stop imagining. Okay? You gotta pay attention to what you read and pay attention to how you think and how your mind automatically looks over these things. Tom's mother has three children. One is April, one is May, and what's the third? Tom. A lot of people say June. An aircraft crashed into a field. Every single person in the aircraft died, but two people survived. How come? They're married. It said every single person died. You got to pay attention. Our brain, as a rule, makes assumptions about certain things. It glosses over, and in your mind, you make assumptions and then come to conclusions based on those assumptions. A murderer is condemned to death. He has to choose between three rooms. One's got raging fires in it. The second's full of assassins with loaded guns, and the third is full of lions that haven't eaten in three years. Which room is the safest for him? Obviously the lions, because they'd be dead if they haven't eaten in three years. Okay? But we make assumptions about the way we think. One of my favorites, a man, he's wearing all black. 
black shoes, black shirt, black hat, black cape, black everything. He's walking down the street directly at a car. The street lights are out and the house lights are not on. And at the last minute, however, the car swerves and avoids the man. How is that possible? Daylight. Daytime. Everybody makes assumptions it must be night. And finally, what do you sit on, sleep on, and brush your teeth with? A lot of people don't realize that the assumption about these questions is that there's one answer. It's a chair, a bed, and a toothbrush. But our mind makes up these things. And if you look at yourself and you ask yourself, why do I follow a particular path, it's because you have certain assumptive thinking that helps you in your life. You answer people's questions before they finish them. You make assumptions about certain people that this member or this person is going to act in this way or these people will respond in this way because that's what they've always, always done. And you don't realize that it's not really the case. You don't realize that you're viewing things through your narrow mind. And that's not a negative, I don't, when I say narrow, that's the concept of you don't have as open a mind. And these kinds of questions and these kinds of things are designed to open your mind, to not make assumptions. If I say how many seconds are in a year, people would take out a calculator instead of saying there are 12, January 2nd, February 2nd, March 2nd, April 2nd. I could go on with these forever, but the concept is that you're automatically, your brain is automatically making these assumptions. So how do we apply this in our real life and how do we use it to encourage involvement and get more members involved and get more people involved and as a pro be more interactive? Well, it comes from first a belief within and that is the concept that you have to have an impatience with mediocrity in the way that you behave and that is the way that you offer yourself out as a pro. You know, I'm reminded of a story that one of my dear friends um, called me and told me this story. He we graduated from Harvard, number one in his class, and this is many years ago. And he gets this internship with Colin Powell. I mean, that's like the bomb, you know, at the time. And calls me on the phone, I got this incredible thing, it's unbelievable, you know, I'm going to be calling you, I need help. Okay, Colin Powell asks him, he wants him to review this, this treaty and this, these embargo statements that have in, in Iraq. And uh, he says, go and go, go write a report on it. And he works all day long. And he leaves at about 6 o'clock at night, piles in there, he puts it in his inbox. He comes back the next morning, about 9 o'clock in the morning. There's this little post note on it. It says, you can do better. Oh, my God, he thinks he's going to lose his job. Okay. He spends the next two days. He's up, he's on the computer, he's talking to friends. He's trying to get the answer to this detail report. And he puts it in Colin Powell's desk and he shows up at 8 o'clock the next morning. There's already a post note on it. You can do better. He calls me on the phone. What am I going to do? I'm going to lose my job. This is horrible. What do I do? I said, you've got to really spend the time. So he calls every senator. He talks to foreign aides. He goes through the internet, and he absolutely writes the most incredible product you've ever seen. He actually goes up to Colin Powell the next morning. He hands it to him, and he says, this is the absolute best possible draft I can do. And Powell says, okay, now I'll read it. <laughs> What is your attitude when you're out there? Are you mailing it in? Or are you giving every single thing you have? Are you trying with all your heart? Are you expanding your horizons in the way in which you view things, in the way in which you offer things? Are you reaching out to every member? How about the members who aren't coming to the tennis courts? Are you connecting with them? If they're not playing, are you asking them how they feel, what's, what's going on in their life? Interacting and bringing people in. You know, I went to a a club fitting not long ago, in, in golf you can go to these various centers and one center on the west coast is called The Vault by TaylorMade and they have this giant room in the room they hook you up on digital diodes and you swing and then they can match your swing in, in a technology that is the most phenomenal thing in the world. When you're in that room you will buy anything because it, 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 whatever the person says, your angle is so steep, and then when you turn and you rotate, and oh, whatever, take me to your leader. You know, <laughs> custom fitting of golf clubs. Why don't we custom fit tennis rackets? Why don't we make that something of real value? Why don't we have custom fitting things where we're actually taking people out in the court and we're educating them on the different kinds of rackets? Do you know how many people at your club 
Know the difference in rackets? None. And the four that say they do aren't telling the truth. The reality is there are so many different rackets, so many different kinds of strings, so many different kinds of weighting, that this can be a leverage tool for you to educate them. Because statistics show that loyalty comes directly from how you empower your members. How proud are they of their club? How proud are they of their teacher or their instructor or their director? How involved do they want to be? How social do you make things? And I'm not talking about just doing a mixer doubles match, but integrating education, rules, things about strings, things about rackets, things about these things that will interest people. You'd be amazed to know how incredible that is. I can tell you from my own experience, I was, when I got back into tennis, I was away from tennis for a while, Lawrence Sagal was in the back said, come to my facility, I got these brand new rackets. You got to try these rackets out. And there were like 10 new rackets that the rep had given. I couldn't tell you the difference between one or another. Without the aid of somebody who knew something, even though I'm a tennis player, I didn't know the weight, the light, which one's head heavy, head light. I swing the ball and the ball goes over the net and okay, I like that one. You'd be surprised at how your education can be leveraged with the people to develop membership loyalty, to develop interest, to develop excitement. You could put a TV screen up in your pro shop and you can have rotating videos that just tell people what difference there is in strings, what differences in rackets, what the clothing technology is, what's out there. And what people want to do is want to be educated. They want to know who has the best backhand right now in the pros. Who has the best forehand? Who has the best drop shot? You ask 10 people, you might get 10 different answers. Educating people is really a wonderful thing and a fantastic thing. And don't make assumptions about the way people think and that you don't think it's going to work. You know, I'm reminded of a story of the two frogs. They're hopping in the, in the jungle and they accidentally jump into this hole that there's no way they can get out of. All the other frogs gather around and they're jumping and they're jumping and they're jumping and they're jumping and the, and, and the frogs up top are screaming at them, you, you, you're wasting your time, it, this is just ridiculous and you're never going to get out of there. And the first frog says, yeah, I guess so, and he gives up and dies. And the second frog keeps jumping and jumping and they're just, they're, they're yelling at him and screaming at him, what do you, stop already, you know, you're killing us. And uh, out of nowhere, the frog jumps up and gets out. And everybody circles around him. And they say, can, can, you, can you tell us, like, why'd you keep jumping? You know, when we were telling you these horrible things, he said, I was deaf. I thought you were encouraging me. <laughs> you never know what people are going to assume about you. You never know what those members might be open to. So don't give up on certain policies and open your mind. And if you don't know about your membership, and you think you do, create input mechanisms. Create mechanisms where they can tell you what they like and what they don't like. And I'm not talking about whether you give towels or not, or whether or not there's water in the right place, or whether that water fountain works. I'm talking about what their interest is in the game. I'm talking about what their interest is in developing a social structure for that game. In developing loyalty and a desire to be a part of this. Because people who join want to participate. And I'll bet every single person in this room could tell me 10 members or more that don't even show up at the courts but are members. Maybe 50 people. It depends on how many members. Why? Have you reached out to them? Have you asked them? Have you talked to them about having them come out, giving them a free lesson, doing something to reintegrate, to reinitiate with those people? Or are you just relying on your existing structure and hoping that those lessons breed more lessons which breed more lessons? What are you doing? as an individual. And that's something that's very important when we're talking about this educational forum that you're in. You're trying to learn new activities, new exercises, the business of tennis, all of the things that help you to be a better person and a better tennis director and a better interactor. But if you ta stop for the moment and you say to yourself, hey, how can I be a better person? How can I open my mind up and expand my horizons? When you can do that and look at yourself, you're going to find that you're going to be a lot stronger in the way in which you do that. And you're going to be a lot more successful with people. You know, it's often when I speak to groups that people don't really know, you know, how to take a, a motivational speaker or, or what have you. What do I do and how do I take those messages and what do I do with that information? Well, I'm here to tell you that Every one of you is talented. I've got to tell you, I've done speeches to hundreds of thousands of people. And this is my love. 
this to me is a privilege to speak to you guys because this is the people that I really want to help. You are the people that really make up the enjoyment level for those people who are out there wanting to play tennis, wanting to learn, wanting to do more. And so for me, it's a passion to really want to help you to reach out not only from the motivational angle, but from the business of tennis angle. And to help you to bridge that gap, to maybe open your mind, to maybe set better goals, to perhaps look and say, how can I do better? How can I improve what I'm doing now? How can I interact more? How can I develop better communication skills? Great way to, to interact with people, and you can use this tool on your friends, your spouse, your mother, your sister, or maybe the members. What I want you to do is the next time you're out with those people, I want you to ask them an open-ended question. What's an open-ended question? Begins with who, what, where, why, when, how, please tell me. Now, your job is to ask questions from their answer. You cannot ask a question that results in a one-word answer. If you do, you lose. So if you say, tell me how your tennis was today, or tell me about how many games you won, or tell me about what you did well in tennis. Well, I hit some good forehands and I hit some good backhands, but I was terrible at this. Well, tell me about those good forehands and see how far you can go. And this is a great tool you can use even if you're talking with your spouses, your girlfriends, your boyfriends, because what it does is it trains you how to ask open-ended questions and how to listen to the answer. You try that. Do not ask a question unless it comes from the words of that person. If you do that, you will find out several things. Number one, you'll find out more about that person than you ever imagined. Two, you will find out that you're probably not listening to what people are really saying. I mean, when we did these questions, most of you look at them and you make assumptions about them. You go, oh my God. You know, I tell people when I do these seminars, I do give these questions out. And then at the end, maybe two days, three days later, I give out ten more questions and they get them all right. Because they break down those assumptions. They start saying, let me listen. Let me look at the communication tools. Let me look at how I can help those people to initiate, to be involved, to interact. I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to get them talking. When you get them talking, you get a more resounding level of what's out there. You get a more resounding understanding of where they're really strong and where they're weak in terms of their views. And understanding those views is critical to the success as a professional. And many of you have been doing this many, many years, and you certainly can walk out of here and say, I'm doing it great, and I don't need any help from you, Scott. But I'm telling you that if you open your mind, and you open your heart, and you look at it from a different perspective, and you get these people involved by getting them talking, by getting them educated, by getting them involved, by saying to yourself, if you're not involved, tell me why you're not involved. Help me to understand I've done these types of events, and I don't see you there. What can I do for you or your group of people or your 15 or 20 or 30 people that would make you want to come to the club? Tell me. Explain it to me. I mean, you're a member. Tell me. And get those answers from those people. Don't just call up and say, hello, how you doing? Are you playing tennis? Great. You want to come out? No, okay. Have a nice day. Yes, we all have to integrate with our entire members and not everybody's a player. But everybody who joins, they're joining either for themselves or for a family member or for some sort of social integration. You cannot rest on your laurels. You must make sure you get every single person involved or that you develop a wealth of information that helps you to understand what the traditions are. You know that whether you're in the north or you're in the west or you're in the south or you're in the east, there are certain types of traditional things. You heard the jokes tonight about the difference between, you know, Boca people and other people and the way they respond. All people respond to positive input. I've never met a person didn't enjoy a compliment. Never met a person liked the criticism. How often are you complimenting? What kind of compliment are you giving that inspires them to want to be involved in your facility? To want to tell their friends, you wouldn't believe what Bruce told me today, what Craig said yesterday, what Chris said the other day. You gotta come out and, and, and hang out with us. You gotta come out and take a lesson. He showed me this trick that, he did this for me, he made me feel so good. And by empowering these people, by enriching their lives, you're developing a brand loyalty and you're developing a, a, a sort of an insurance policy, a way of when you look at general management, when you look at other people who say, oh, the golf course is doing better than you, you can say, listen, I've developed a culture. I've developed a group of people that thoroughly enjoy being around me and being around this experience. And even if they don't, I'm finding out what makes them tick. And I am driving that to them.
I believe there is a day with the future of technology where people will go into the pro shop and will invest in the pro shop like they do in the golf shop. But I believe it comes from making tennis more than just memberships and lessons and leagues. That's not to say that isn't good. It's to say that we want to expand it out and create a culture. If you look at social media, you realize that everybody's following somebody on Twitter. Everybody's following somebody on Pinterest. Everybody's following somebody. What are they following them for? They're following them because they're interested in finding out more about them or in learning something or in sharing something. You have to realize that the technology is here for you. Embrace it, take it, leverage it, and use it in every way you can. Because if you do, if you get people involved, if you have the tip of the day and everybody's email gets it, if you have an automatic video that's sent to them, I'll give you the videos, that's sent to them, that makes them feel good, that tells them a great way to communicate, or how to build a dream, or how to achieve a goal, or how to overcome something that had, had happened to them that isn't good, and it comes to their email every day, you're touching them. You're keeping your name in front of them. You're keeping your club in front of them. You're keeping these people in an energized and excited way. Do not approach tennis like it is just about lessons. It is just about membership. Approach it like it is a wide social forum that technology can help you. For those of you who don't know technology or don't like technology, I am telling you technology, it's easy. You don't have to know it, just understand it's easy. There's always someone who knows how to do it. And if you remember that and understand that, you'll leverage that technology. Because if you, if you think about it, if you're touched every day, if somebody is, is involved with your life, you're more likely to remember them. Think about the people that you interact with now. You remember them more than the people you used to interact with. I don't talk to the guys I played tennis with many years ago, so I don't think about them. But if we were tied in and we kept that culture alive, we would be more interested. And if you think about that, I think that it will expand your horizons. Obviously, you're all very successful people. You wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be winning all the awards you're winning. But I'm just planting a seed. I'm just offering another opportunity to maybe widen your horizons and recognize that membership and loyalty can mean a lot more that as part of your professional endeavors that you can make a very big difference in the lives of these people. You'd be surprised how interested people are in what a tennis pro knows. You'd be amazed. And if you don't believe it, try it on some people. Start talking to them about what you know about tennis. What you know. Talk about the French Open. Explain to them who you think is good and bad. Who has the best backhand and why. And ask them, well, you watch, watch and tell me whether you think Gasquet's backhand is better than Federer's backhand or is better than this guy's backhand. And have them watch. And you know what they'll do? They'll go watch. And they'll come back and they'll give you your insight. Are you doing that? Are you creating these other avenues, these opening of the mind avenues that make people excited, that make people want to say, I want to go higher Chris to teach my kid, or I want to have a lesson with you, or I just like you, I want to be around you. That's how we grow tennis individually, that's how we grow it regionally, that's how we grow it nationally. And if you all have that impatience with mediocrity, you all have that mentality that you will not settle for anything less than complete involvement, anything less than achieving your goals and achieving something more tomorrow than you did today, and recognizing that I don't care what happened in the past. I don't care what mistakes you think you made or what you didn't do before or whatever. What I care about is what you're doing now. I have an expression, what you do now defines you. And for those people who are stuck in their ways, let me tell you the story about President Harrison. President Harrison got elected and wanted to do his speech on the inaugural day that every president does it. And he told his aides, I'm doing the speech, and the aides said, do not do that speech because it is snowing and it is 30 below. Do not do the speech. We can do it another day. You're the president. I am doing it on the inaugural day. And by golly, he went out there that day and he did it. And he gave a brilliant speech. Brilliant! Brilliant speech. Caught in pneumonia and died two months later. For those of you who are stuck in your ways, how about adaptability? If you don't feel like changing, how about getting the people around you to help you change? Remember, I'm not asking for revolutionary change. I'm asking you, when I tell people, I'm asking you to move, I want you to watch this very closely, this much. Let me do that again. Ready? This much. Because if you move this much, a week from now, you're 100 yards. A month from now, you're a mile. 
try something. Open your mind to the possibilities. Explore that. Tell me the next time I see you some things about your members that you didn't know. Tell me some things about your club that you didn't know. And if you have a great group of people, that's when you invite your general manager out and all these other people. You say, let me bring you to an event or just to a mixer or just to a social gathering. And I want you to see the way these people like what they do and like this culture. And you know what? They'll start envying you instead of critiquing you. And I believe that is the way to expand tennis. I believe that is the way to expand the entire industry of tennis. That is the way to develop brand loyalty and people wanting to buy from you and increasing products and doing all the things that you want to do. Now, I'd love to be here all night and talk to you, but I know that we have a lot of other things to do. And I wanted to leave you with a thought. And that is that, as you've seen on the Smile Power memo, if you guys haven't seen it, you should take a look at it. It's a lot easier to be positive than negative. It's a lot easier to be happy than sad. You do not realize how much energy it takes to be miserable. It takes some skill, some talent, some real talent. And if you find that you're short with someone, if you find that you tend to talk down to people, change that paradigm. Start from tomorrow and say, you know what I'm going to do? No matter, if I need to get my maintenance guy to sweep the, 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 the courts and he hasn't been doing it, I'm going to figure out a way to empower him in some way. I'm going to say, thank you for sweeping the courts yesterday. I really appreciated what a good job you did. I need you to make sure you get it done tonight in the same great way. Can you do that for me? Yes. And I think if you approach that, you'd be stunned at what kind of response you're going to get. And embrace that in the way in which you live your life, both professionally and interpersonally. And you will see there will be a lot more joy. And you will see that arguments that seem to be arguments will disappear. Is it ever productive to argue? Is it ever productive to yell? Is it ever productive? Uh, anger, the most wasted emotion in the world. You don't feel good about it. The person you're being angry to doesn't feel good about it. You're done, nobody feels good. Nothing's gained by it. And now you have to find a way to extricate yourself from that anger because you have to make contact with somebody else and you can't be angry at them. Get rid of these wasted emotions and start talking about positive. Start talking about the things that you can make a difference in the world. And I think if you do that, you will be a real champion. And you will expand your horizon and you will expand your business in ways that you never imagined. I, I want to thank you for the privilege of being able to share time with you. I will, I will stay around if you guys want me to sign books or give you more books or talk to you about anything you want. But I think it's time for you to make that next step. Thank you so much.